It's my pleasure to introduce to you Tom Harmon. So in continuing our national updates, Tom is going to share regarding the Everyday Counts Initiative in more detail. Tom is the director of the Federal Highway Administration Center for Accelerating Innovation. I'm gonna have a little fun today. I'm a little quasi scripted. Uh, I wanna go through a few items. And I just wanna talk about innovation and the tools that are available to you. And I wanna see who's using those tools and thinking about them. So this may sound really, really weird, but I just wanna start with a simple question. And the reason why I start with this simple question is I've been in meetings recently, high level, high brow committee, ashto meetings, and about halfway through the meeting, someone will say, well, how are you defining innovation? It sounds like a simple question, right? But then you find out that some people are talking about it is a process leading to something, and others, it's a product. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? Is it, what is it? So how do you define innovation? It's, it's, two, it's two directional today, I apologize. Come on, how do you define it? Something new, I like that. What else? Something old, something new, something blue, right? No, sorry. Something repurposed. Something repurposed, I like that. Or you stole from another industry, right? We did not invent drones, did we? No, are we repurposing them or finding purposes for them? What else? An enhancement it could be incremental, all right? So that, that's neat as well. So I get to play in safety and operations and in pavements and in bridges and all those things. And occasionally you realize that we're innovating in such a way that what's good for here is gonna cause challenges there, right? How many people think it's really great that we have autonomous trucks? that drive straight down the lane and don't wander. Come on, pavement engineers, you should be cringing, right? So if I expect 30% of the fleet in the next 10 years to have some level of autonomy that's gonna allow it to track within the lane, what should I be doing to my pavements today with regard to the surface treatments? I could, should be assuming that what I'm building today is not gonna work. So today I need to be designing for that traffic mix because in 10 years those pavements should still be in service, right? Hint, hint. Had a discussion with Nate, we were talking about Maryland. Maryland had this crazy guy named Larry Michael. Larry Michael promoted SMA. SMA is one of the tools I would think would be in our toolbox to deal with non-wandering truck traffic, right? And there's other techniques as well that are out there. Um, another one is a lot of these cars see due to contrast, so what happens when our shoulder lane stripe goes in and out and my Tesla can't see? All of a sudden, that becomes a really high priority maintenance item. Uh, we're also doing safety features like putting uh, rumble strips down the center line. Do you know when people hit those, they overcorrect back? And as a cyclist, I don't like that. There's all these interactions that are out there right now that we need to think about, and this is a pretty fun time to be in this industry. So, um, someone said this. It's something new. This is, you know, if you go to Google a dictionary, this is Webster's definition. A new idea, a new method, new device, or the repurposing, that's also it. But now, in selling our story, because we heard from the commissioner that we need to be able to sell what we're doing, because if we're not selling what we're doing, we're going to be taken for granted, and our money is going to be kind of in and out. It's really important to start with why. So if anyone says, well, let's, let's be innovative, push back, because innovation is disruptive and annoying. If I'm going to innovate, I need to know why. I want to innovate because I want to save lives. I want to save time. I want to save money. I want to be more responsible with regard to my resources. I want to reduce congestion. I want to increase the quality of life. We need to start with our why. Preservation is not glamorous, but it makes sure that the assets we have in place today are there for tomorrow. And that's really, really important. I'm concerned about where my children and... The other thing you want to ask yourself when you say the word innovation is, it, are we talking incremental? Are we talking truly disruptive, truly game-changing? So this is kind of the spectrum of terms I often hear thrown out. Incremental, that's really important. That's, uh, it's now called COMP, the Committee on Materials and Pavements. 
used to be the subcommittee of materials, they're advancing the standards, right? Really important work, but is it transformative? It has to be done. Noteworthy, that's when one state does something really, really, really cool on their own, and we want to share that all over the world. Emerging, gap-filling, significant, advances the state of the art, and game-changing. So you can think of drones, you can think of autonomous vehicles, they kind of fall in that upper realm, and then we got to think how they play back in the whole spectrum of bridges, pavements, everything with regard to that. And we're also being able to ask continuously to justify, justify, justify investment. What is the return on the investment or the outcome of innovation? I just told you autonomous vehicles are great. They're going to be safer. They're still not going to like, be zero crashes. We know that. But what if autonomous technology puts cyclists at risk? Because I have an autonomous vehicle. I try to move out of the way and the damn thing pulls me back. We want to know what the outcomes are associated. So we need to be able to measure, we need to be able to quantify, and we need to be able to market the results. And the best way to market the results is not to have, you need to be able to tell that story. Tell the story about that particular project. Because if you'll notice how we promote the Everyday Counts program, you'll see there's the metrics and the measures, but then there's the individual state stories or the local stories. Because those are the ones we remember. Those are the ones that really sell what you're doing. I heard this in Arizona. I did not make it up. Uh, Carla Petty reminded me of this. She's our division manager and administrator out there. Figures tell, stories sell. So engineers and technicians in the room, you want to find that story with regard to your technology because that's what's going to sell what we're doing. I had to write that one down. Now, now here's this innovation or innovate verb to noun, and it's really how we need to think about the creativity process. It starts with somebody challenging the status quo. That works okay, but can we do better? So that's when you start innovating. That's when the creativity kicks in. When you have an invention, that doesn't mean you have changed the world. There's a lot of inventions. You can go out and look at the number of patents there are. That there's not that many products in the market. There's lots and lots of patents, ideas out there. How do we bring it to an innovation where it's market ready, proven, and being utilized. That's a big key to this. And then eventually, it's not innovative anymore. Matter of fact, it's just standard practice. And I want you to think about that last part because one of the things I'm gonna discuss is the aid demo grant program. And we're really thinking about that last two sequence to take some things off the table for aid demo grants because I really can't call them innovative anymore when most of the states are using them. Just because you're last to get in line doesn't mean you get that money. It's another way to look at it. So the difference between an invention and innovation is marketing and communication. It's that story. That's the thing that brings it forward. So what is the story? We've got something new to tell here. So here's four simple questions that keep me awake at night. Where do you go if you have an idea? Whether you're from industry, an individual, or a DOT. You have this really cool idea that you think will just save money. I get phone calls at least once a week. Somebody has an idea that they want to do something with. What support is available? How do you get it market ready? NCHRP, and no disrespect, $38 million a year right now, with the, that's about what it works out to. Uh, programs have been around since 1962. They generate a lot of reports. They decided a number of these reports aren't bringing them to market. So they set aside a fund of up to $2 million per year to take those things and make them more market ready, of which no more than $180,000 is used to market the results. There's a little disconnect here. So we do all this research, we get all these products out. How do we bring it across to make it market ready? And then the last question is how long does it take? Well, is how long does it take to have an idea, do the research, and bring it, and, and have this industry accept it? Many years. I didn't do the accent right, did I? Many, many oh, you'll do it when you get up here. Many years. All right, so now, as I, as, that's all introduction. As I jump into my talk, here's the thing I'm going to throw out to you. If you have an idea, if an innovation, I have this really hard to remember email address. It's my crowdsourcing email address. Innovation at dot That's innovation at dot Can you guys remember it? Innovation at dot If you send an email to that email address, my entire staff will see it. 
and we will pounce on it. You will get a response back very quickly. We get excited when things come into this email address. Anything, doesn't matter. So here's what I'm gonna talk about today. First, I'm gonna talk about spider webs, and that's from a No Doubt song, but it kinda works for me. Looking for your thoughts on some things, because we've got some stuff emerging, and then I want to talk about three pillars that are happening right now with Federal Highways and ASHTO through the RNI Committee, and what that means. So spider webs, assessing the market readiness and looking at the landscape of technology programs that are out there available to you. So there's something called a technology readiness level. Has anybody ever heard of this? No hands. All right, so NASA developed this many, many years ago as they were trying to see from a component standpoint, system engineering, when it was ready to go to the next phase towards launch. And it looks at how ready is something within the market. You'll see there's a spectrum, basic research, applied research, development, that's when I get excited, it's in the development stage. And then lastly, market ready and proven, that's a technology readiness level of nine. If you have this thing called a, a smart device or the internet, go to Google or YouTube, go to YouTube and type technology readiness level and there's this little three minute video, it's a whiteboard video um, that talks about the TRL process. And what it does is it gives us a way to talk about where we are in this spectrum. You know, when that s column to the right, uh, six to eight, that's where it gets exciting. Prototype demonstrated in a relevant environment. Prototype demonstrated in an operational environment. Like in a relevant environment, what if I had an autonomous truck and Buzz let me run them around the track? That would be, I proved it at a level six. But then what if I put it out on the interstate and ran it? That would be an eight, right? And it lets you see where you are in the process. I've heard this said a lot, and then the more I looked into it, I think it's kind of true. Is there a chasm between research and practice? Kinda, right? Because it can take many, many years to get things out. Um, I apologize for those people who watch out for diversity. I was trying to find one of these that had a man and a woman spanning across the thing, but then I realized the women just walk across the men's backs, so that works just fine. This right here is my spider web. Uh, here's every program at the federal, state, ASHTO, TRB level that's available to advance innovation. It's not meant to read, it's meant to show you there's lots and lots and lots and lots of programs that have sprung up for all the right reasons. And CHRP was back in 1962. A lot of the programs I managed started in uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, we've got a new one rolling out here this year as well. And then you also have industry and others coming in. So when you start looking at those relative to this technology readiness level, and don't dwell on this one, what you're gonna find is there's caps. We spend a lot of time spending money and time over here, but not so much time and money over here. And the last few steps in the process is where it gets expensive. It's easy to do laboratory tests, it's harder to do full-scale testing, and then it's really hard to do it out operationally. So here's what's available to you through my office to help you in advancing innovation. And it's okay if you don't know all these, but it's not okay if you wanna advance innovation that you don't at least look at these. First thing is, by show of hands, how many people know their state has a State Transportation Innovation Council? Not everybody's hands up right now. So we gotta spend a lot of money there, very important. Um, the first one is, uh, and I, this is by the number, we're in the fourth round of the Everyday Counts program, the on-ramp to innovation. That's our new tagline, you'll get used to that. Um, my uh, acting administrator came up with it, it's kinda cool. It's a two-year model, it's state-based. We go through a vetting process, we identify innovations, we figure out a dozen or so to promote. We promote them in the fall, the states sign up for them. It's literally that, they either sign up for one, none, or all. New York usually signs up for all. They do my all. Uh, it's a great program, it works really well. We have lots and lots of story and lots and lots of data to show that we're able to accelerate the rapid, wide national deployment of market-ready improvement technologies. The next one is the sticks. So every state has up to $100,000 a year, use or lose, to do something with regard to innovation to them. And the stick councils meet at least twice a year, some of them meet more often. They're open meetings. Your point of contact 
it, you just saw for Connecticut who your point of contacts are. If you don't know, reach out to your division office or if you Google Everyday Counts, you'll come to my website and there's a tab for sticks and there's points of contacts for every stick in the nation right there. Also what they've been doing as well, which is really neat. So the stick network is great. Here's how this money is used best. And it goes back to what I heard twice from our first two presenters. Learn other people in this room that do what you do in different states because people use this money a lot to do peer exchanges. They use it for invitational travel to go see each other and talk and exchange and see what's happening elsewhere. That is probably one of the best uses of this money. The other thing that a lot of states do are innovation days where they showcase homegrown technologies and this is a trend that's catching on. We have about a handful or so, about half a dozen that do this every year. And an innovation day is you, you'll have secretaries challenges and you'll have uh, all kinds of fun things happening. You can see what's going on. I, the most recent one I was at was at Delaware and Secretary Cohen walked around and looked at all of these really, really, really neat innovations. It was, it was fun to see. Um, next one down is the aid demonstration program. Uh, it's a, a it's a competitive grant program that's on a rolling solicitation up to a million dollars to put in innovation in a project. It's for the Delta cost. So if you want to try something you haven't tried before, that's a great place to go as well. Uh, and then the next one down here is accelerating market readiness. I have a little bit more on this. This is, this is Tom's crazy idea. And then if you read the law, each state has the ability to use within their own federal allotment up to 5% of their federal share increased on a project for innovation. So it doesn't give you any more federal dollars, but it allows you to leverage your federal dollars. Instead of an 80-20 project, you can do 85-15, where that extra 5% of that project is for that innovation. And a number of states have latched onto this and used it a lot. So let's talk a little bit more about the Everyday Counts program. Um, it was started back in 2011. The first time out of the shoot, there were 14 innovations. And I will tell you right now, all of them weren't market ready and proven. But they were all really good. And someone's going to say, give me an example of one that wasn't market ready and program. GRS IBS, the, the burrito walls. When we first tried it, we learned a lot rolling it out those first two years. And then we did it the following round, having learned a lot. And then it became market ready and proven. If we were going to do that TRL scale, that technology was more at an eight than a nine. But by the time we got into the second cycle of everyday counts, it was at a nine, which was really neat. Uh, you can see every two years, I, I think it's counting down. It goes 14, 13, 12, 11, 10 um, for everyday counts round five. Those numbers are a little misleading in that um, we've always had projects that are bundled of other technologies. There's a couple that are going to be in this next round that are multiple technologies as well. Uh, and I think we're getting better at how we go through this process, too. Uh, the other thing I added in here is our market identifiers have changed throughout the project. Here's our themes for Everyday Counts round five. Uh, safety, it's number one, got to worry about it. Operations, project delivery, and innovation. So you're going to see projects in each one of those. And if I hadn't hidden the slide, you would actually see what the projects are. They will be rolled out beginning of June by our uh, Acting Administrator Brandy Hendrickson. We had a meeting two weeks ago with our stakeholders. They were really, really engaged. Um, it was pretty amazing that they, they had thoughts on every one of the items, so we're doing some adjustment to what we proposed. And then late summer, August, September, there will be webinars available on all these technologies that you can go and watch. There's webinars on the pavement preservation projects, you can go and watch and see what they were proposing two years ago. And then we will have our summits. And here's our list of summit locations. Um, Albany's going to be the Northeast. Each state is allowed to bring 12 people. We're going to pay for 10. The other two are on the state to pay for. Uh, so they have to have some skin in the game. It's sort of our 80-20 rule on that one. And we will showcase these technologies. The other thing we're going to have at this one, Amy, is we're going to have a discussion on research and how research is helping facilitate what we're doing in deployment, trying to bridge that gap. Because there's a lot of efforts right now to really make a return on investment with regard to our research dollars. So accelerating market readiness. Do you have an idea? Anybody have an idea that they want to try? Something new? Scott raised his hand. Um, this is a sometime around August, if we get it out, is a broad agency announcement. Anybody can apply for this. 
it's three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars per activity to take an idea that's near market ready and get it tried. And we're going to be working very closely with something called the Asheville Innovation Initiative, a handful of chief engineers that are going to come together and help us find proving grounds for these technologies. And this is intended to help us with feeding the pipeline for everyday accounts, but also proving other technologies and making sure substantive reporting is done. So this is what I heard from states. So states told states this. This isn't Tom telling states this. States do a really good job evaluating new technologies, but they don't often write very good reports that other states can use. So if you're a supplier, you gotta go and sell your product in each state over and over and over again, and that can get tiring. Right, Scott? Yes, okay. Scott helped me out with the summits two years ago and talked about some of the challenges of deploying a new technology. The broad aging the announcement is gonna be the summer. We're gonna work closely with the ASHTO uh, Innovation Initiative. We're gonna use what's called their lead state model, and our goal is to use something called APEL, the ASHTO Product Evaluation List, to post our findings. So this is very much in partnership with the states. So the Accelerating Innovation Deployment Demonstration Grant Program, we have a lot of money that's gone out the door. Uh, we're currently in the process of going back and revisiting all of those projects. So if you're in a state that received money for aid, we're gonna be reaching out to you to see what impact you had. I'll give you a simple example. Arizona got a million dollars to do LED lighting several years ago in a tunnel. And it worked really well. And then they decided we need to be using LED lighting everywhere. So because of that investment, it's now much more widespread utilization. We wanna see that. Was it one and done? Or are you doing more of the innovation because you received the aid grant? That's gonna be the thing. The other thing is we're looking at how do we tell somebody that warm mix asphalt is no longer innovative. I will tell you that. I'm not paying for an aid demo grant for warm mix asphalt, even though I promoted it under EDC1. It's, it's technology. It's not innovation anymore. It's, it's part of the industry. So we're gonna go through our list of innovations we promoted in the past and some of them are gonna come off the plate because most people are using it. Some emerging needs, and this is on the Ashto side of the house. So Ashto reorganized, if you don't know Ashto reorganized, go to their website, there's this really cool information graphic that shows how they reorganized. If I look at it one more time, I'm gonna get it. The R&I committee is the new home for the Ashto Innovation Initiative and they have a special group looking specifically at innovation. We are standing up a community of practice. We're trying to put together a centralized clearing hub for innovation, those things that are coming out with a TRL of seven or above. And we're trying to bite that spider web and come up with a national flow path for innovation. So when you have an idea, you don't have to know the right person to talk to. You can go and have a resource tool that'll help you figure out where is the best fit for where you are with regard to your technology today to advance it and get resources because you shouldn't have to be in this industry 30 years to figure that out. This is a direct result of the discussion we had at the summits. They brought it back. Say, hey, you talk, we listen. Now here's the cool thing. If you have ideas how a community practice should work, which you think a centralized clearing hub should look like, or what a national flow path should look like, there's this email address, innovation at DOT. I wanna hear, because this has not been etched in stone yet. This is very much napkins and passing around. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to stand this up and do, do it well. Uh, for the State Innovation Forum, we brought together a number of states have done something really crazy. They've actually made an innovation officer. And in realizing that, we put together a peer exchange. Again, peers coming together to talk about what are some best practices. Because here's the weird thing, as good as the EDC model is, it's not gonna be innovative next cycle unless we do something different. It's just business as usual. And do I really want an innovation program that's not innovative? That sounds kind of weird. So states are learning and growing and doing things very rapidly. We are looking at how to gather these nuggets that are out there. One silly example, and it's not silly. Best way to do a fantastic job in a company is hire well, have fantastic people. And when you have fantastic people, recognizing them. I'd love to know how all the states are recognizing leaders in innovation. They would like to know as well. And there's really cool ideas, everything from coins to days off to uh, lunch with the boss, all these things that are out there. And those little things are huge. So we're gonna learn from each other. And one of the ways we learn from each other is we have an excellence award that is uh, 
promote it up through our sticks. We're looking for really cool ideas of what they've done and stories. Uh, the, there's an active solicitation right now. If you know of your state doing something cool with regard to sticks, this is honored at AASHTO's uh, fall meeting. Uh, I'm accepting the applications right now. I want to hear from you. These are your programs that I just went through. Uh, if you add it all up, there's about $30 million that processes through my office each year. I don't keep any of it. It all goes out, which is really neat. We just make sure it goes to good places. Uh, I always like to end on a good note. Here's my good notes for today. Um, the, the running joke in the house that makes my wife cringe is uh, I gave all my kids their first name, Ashley, Corey, and Connor. And one day it dawned on me, I named them ACC, Asphalt, Cement, Concrete. She does not like that joke. So uh, I have a daughter who is now at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Sorry about that for anybody going to Virginia. Uh, and she is on the dance team. So her freshman year, she got to be there when number 16 beat number one, which was a hoot. Uh, don't ask her how finals are going right now because there were two weeks in the middle of the semester she got behind. Um, that thing in the center is my white pickup truck. And here's a word of advice to any parent. When your child says, hey, I want to paint the truck, don't say okay until you say, how do you want to paint the truck? She did that when we were at the beach. I came home. I think it's wonderful. Um, my son is a gymnast. He just competed at nationals, which is just crazy. I was at West Point for the first time in my life, beautiful campus. And my other son is hugely active in Special Olympics. Uh, Special Olympics golf is gearing up right now. I'm excited about that as well. This is the important stuff. This is where things shine. Any questions, comments? One word I didn't hear you say was proprietary. Also, proprietary products. That's really good. All right, so here, you want to know what's happening in proprietary? Yeah. All right, so we had a national conversation at the summits with regard to proprietary products. And uh, my executive director, Butch Weidluck, who is retiring in two weeks, mm, sad day, uh, we developed an updated memorandum that really pushes as far as we can within the guidelines of the law. It, it pushes a lot of authority back down to the states for tools they can elect to use. And I don't mean this mean or anything. Uh, states use the feds as the bad guys occasionally. And if they want to make us the bad guys, we have big, broad shoulders. States have, are in a position to do proprietary products if they elect, and the guidelines have been provided to them. To do fully lift of proprietary products would require Congress to give us that authority, because we would need to be able to create an environment uh, that allowed monopolies to exist. They have not done that. There is momentum from AGC and ARPA for that. They can go talk to the Hill as much as they want until the president signs something. It's the tooth fairy to me. But uh, that memo is out. It is very clean about what you can do. And it also gave much more broader authority with regard to safety equipment. The only area that we got to dig our heels in until somebody does something is the MUTCD, because we're required by law. Uh, to exclude proprietary products from that. So the stick rants, I heard her, I, I'll repeat. So the $100,000 can be used as one $100,000 or it can be used as 10, $10,000 things. I don't care. The only thing I've heard from a uh, tracking is if you have a project that has like six things in it, but it's a project for $100,000, that's easier to track financially than to break it into six little discrete things because if one overruns and the other doesn't, it makes challenges for the division offices. Now, we, if, if you go to the website, you'll see that some states, usually it's one to four activities happen each year with those grants, uh, but we're encouraging through our coordinators that they make it one project with multiple activities because it's much easier to handle the cash flow that way. Does that mean that each state only gets 100 that means each state gets up to $100,000 per year under the stick incentive. However, if a state wants to double down one year and do nothing the following year, they have an activity that's one hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000, we will allow that. I'm trying to be innovative and touch my toes. So if you go on the website, you'll see Ohio got $200,000 one year because they had a project they were going to do. The other thing that the states can do is have they can ask for 100,000 on September 30th and October 2nd, ask for another 100,000 and combine them. That's happened too. I'm okay with that, but 100,000 per year up to. Innovation at dot.gov. Bye guys.
Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.